In science labs and other lab courses, you're used to conducting experiments, but how do you design that experiment in order for it to be conducted? So let's think about this in a statistical context. You identify what problem you want to be solved. Um, you obviously want to be as explicit as you can be, figure out where you think it's going to go, um, and then try to make some kind of claim. Like, I think this will happen if I do this, right? That's your hypothesis. We'll talk more about that in a later chapter. You determine the factors that affect that response variable. So what are the things that I might think might affect what's going on here, right? What, what I think will have an influence. I determine how many experimental units I would want. Um, we'll talk about more of that in later chapters, <laughs> um, particularly 9.1 and 9.2. It's actually also 9.4. Um, because I actually stole them out of 9.1 and 9.2 and put them into a section call it 9.4. Um, so that's where the sample size portions are. But there's a way to figure that out. Um, and then you determine how many factors you want and how you're going to do randomization. So do you want one control group that has a placebo or do you want a control group that just has standard treatment? What are the various levels that you're going to have for your um, explanatory variable, your response variable, all of that stuff. So you figured all of that out. How are you going to have random assignment? Um, are you going to assign the experimental units? Are you going to assign the treatments? Where, where's the experimentation or the randomization, excuse me, going to happen? And then you, of course, after you've got all of that figured out and written down usually, then you um, conduct the experiment, um, make sure that it's replicable. So you get, should be able to replicate and do it over and over and over. You collect and process your data and then you use inferential statistics, which we'll talk about in later chapters, to test the claim that you're making. Now, well-designed studies will account for potential confounding, but of course, um, it's usually impossible to make it go away entirely. But there you have it. There's the process of making an experiment. It's a lot easier when you just show up to class and the experiment's designed for you and all you have to do is this part and this part, right? So you just do these two parts and maybe this and that's it. But of course, if, if you're having to, you know, work at a job where they want you to design an experiment to show something, you'd have to start at the very beginning, right up here at step one and work your way all through and figure out how you're going to design it. And if it involves humans, well, then you're going to be spending a lot of time up in these four regions because humans and animals and all that, if you want to do testing on any of those, then they would require you to have all sorts of checks and run it by approval boards and robot and by all sorts of things. All right, now let's talk about the designs of an experiment. There are three types that we're going to look at. The first type is a completely randomized design. Right? So this is one of the things that we look at when you look at how are you going to set this up, right? So what are the, how are you going to set up your randomization? How are you going to set up your control groups? So that's what we're kind of analyzing is the, the three of the different ways that you can do that. So a completely randomized design is an experimental design in which the experimental units are randomly assigned to a treatment. So this is probably what you think of when you think of an experiment. You know, you randomly put people in groups and then give each group a different treatment. Simple as that. So very basic, straightforward. And let's see an example to help us understand this. So researchers enrolled 247 women between the ages of 70 and 93 in a study. The women were randomly assigned into three groups. The individuals in group one attended a computer class three times a week for 90 minutes each session. The individuals in group two enrolled in an exercise program three times a week for 90 minutes each session. Right? It's the same amount of time, but different classes. One's computers, one's exercise. The individuals in group three were told to stick to their normal routines. After six months, the women were issued a survey that results in the age satisfaction score. So how satisfied are you with, with life, essentially? And you'll notice these are elderly ladies. The subjects in group two had a significantly higher age satisfaction score than the subjects in the other groups. All right, why is this a completely randomized design? Well, because the experimental units were randomly assigned to one of three treatments. How many levels of treatment are there and what are there? Well, there were three levels. They were the computer class, the exercise class, 
and quite frankly, the placebo group, right? The, the control group. So the neutral treatment. which was the placebo, right? Just doing your normal everyday thing. Now the response variable is their score on this age satisfaction survey. So how happy are you with your life at this point in your age? So it's the score on the age satisfaction survey. So they're trying to see, hey, are you happier? Are you more satisfied with one of these three treatments? Now, what variables were controlled in the study? Well, that's interesting. They were all women. So they're trying to control for gender differences by having them all be women. And you'll notice they have them do three times a week, 90 minutes, three times a week, 90 minutes, right? So they're trying to control for amount of time as well as um, gender. So gender, amount of time, and times per week. Right, they're trying to control for all of that. So they're trying to make it the same, right? Those things the same for all groups, right? So when you're thinking about this controlling in the study, they're trying to make it so that it's fair to compare across groups. And the only way you can do that is if you control certain things. So you're trying to make them the same for all groups. Now, it's not, meaning, it's not talking about the control group. The control group is this group that receives the neutral treatment. It's saying what things were, were controlled in the study, what things are made the same for all the groups so it's fair to compare. That's what that means. And it was gender and the amount of time and the times per week. All right, what variable was manipulated? Well, obviously, the type of class they were taking. or not taking a class at all. All right, now what about the role of randomization? Randomization was used to, was used to select which women went into which group. Oops. I w got weird there. Women. Right? So that's how randomization was used in this study. Um, it helps avoid bias, right? Because if you let everybody get together with their friends, then that's not going to work. So you randomly assign them because otherwise, you know, a whole crew will go together to the computer class or the whole crew will go together to the exercise class. If they're already friends, then maybe that will have an effect on what's going on. So if you randomly assign them, it helps avoid bias. To what population do the results of the study apply? Well, they're obviously trying to talk about women age 70 to 90, right? So maybe all women age 70 to 90. You could maybe argue all people age 70 to 90. Um, usually they, they stop it and just make it um, one gender to control for gender differences. But I would say it's fair to say all women aged 70 to 93. Honestly, 93 might just be who, who the oldest person was. So let's say 70 and up. I think that's fair. can spell the word up. There we go. All right, now let's draw a figure to illustrate this design. It's not too bad. So you have your random assignment and it puts you into three groups. So up here, you're in group one. We don't know how many people were in each of these groups. They didn't say that. Um, so group one is a certain number of individuals. They receive computer class. Group two is right here, and they received the exercise class. And group three is right here, and they received placebo. All right, so at the start right here, 
is the random assignment. Right there at the beginning. And then at the end, their satisfaction scores were compared. Actually, I can just bring it all to the same point right here. Age satisfaction at that. That's what a completely randomized design looks like. So if you look at the definition at the top of the page, it says an experimental design in which experimental units are randomly assigned to treatments, right? So here are the treatments right here. Right there, that's that list. And here are the groups, right? The random groups. Oops, sorry, I ran out of space to write that. And there you have it. So you have your random groups, you have your treatments, you compare at the end. That's what a completely randomized design looks like. I mean, it's pretty much what you'd expect it to be, right? So it's, it seems pretty straightforward and seems very common, right? This must be a very common type of experimental design.